Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Roya Hakakian, and it is my honor to be moderating this uh, fantastic and very important panel today uh, on the subject of the downing of the Ukrainian flight uh, 752 uh, back in the January of this year um, uh, by the Iranian uh, members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Um, we have a a great group of panelists uh, this afternoon, um, whom I will uh, introduce very briefly. However, I want to emphasize the word briefly uh, because um, I want you to think of this introduction as a mere teaser because the bios are incredibly wonderful. Uh, and I invite you all to um, uh, look at these biographies and discover these great individuals who are involved in this case. Um, so, um, I'd like to, um, start with, um, our first, uh, speakers who will be Senator Mary Lou McFadren and, uh, Member of Parliament Michael Levitt and, um, who are here with us at the moment, uh, Senator Mary Lou McFadren. Um, has been a dean at the University of Winnipeg um, and the Global College in Manitoba. In 1985, Senator McFadren became the youngest lawyer to be named a member of the Order of Canada in recognition of her co-leadership of the Ad Hoc Committee of Canadian Women on the Constitution. The Ad Hoc Committee was a grassroots movement for strengthening equality rights during the drafting of the Constitution of Canada. In 2001, Senator McFadren was named one of, the, one of Canada's uh, 10 most influential women rights activists um, it, uh, by the Homemakers magazine. And these are merely a few of the opening lines uh, that I was very biased to because they were all about um, her role as a uh, leader uh, in women's equality rights. Um, the next person, um, I would like to introduce uh, is um, uh, uh, parliamentary member, uh, Mr. Michael Levitt. Um, he has been a chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee and a co-chair of the Raoul Wallenberg All-Party Parliamentary uh, Caucus for Human Rights and formerly the chair of the International Human Rights Committee. In those capacity, he had also launched important parliamentary initiatives, including co-chairing the annual Iran Accountability Week in the parliament. Um, these two will be our first uh, two um, speakers today. Um, and I would like to open um, with my own remarks and hoping to um, get everyone talking about some, um, about some of the issues that uh, those of us who have been watching uh, the violations of human rights in Iran and the issue uh, and the political place of uh, uh, Iran in the last 40 years uh, within uh, the politics of Middle East and elsewhere might wish to consider. Um, one of the very uh, interesting aspects of this particular tragedy is that unlike the overwhelming majority of other human rights violations and um, and the governmental violations that um, Iran has committed and continues to commit is that um, it, it occurs in the uh, overlap of uh, the Iranian politics and uh, Iranian domestic issues as well as international ones. Meaning that so many of the violations of human rights that do occur in Iran uh, do not spill over to the international community. And therefore it makes it much harder for the international community to exert any influence. There are uh, a, a legions of uh, activists and human rights activists, uh, women's activists um, and political oppositions, journalists who uh, have been arrested and continue to languish in prison, but they, uh, their cases are much harder to influence uh, or for the international community to get involved with. However, in the past 40 years, there have been few opportunities where a violation that has taken place um, within Iran or to an Iranian citizen 
however involving uh, the international community, provided an opportunity for um, non-Iranians and for human rights advocates to get involved. This, in my belief, is one of those cases where uh, the downing of the uh, Ukrainian flight, um, given uh, the, the involvement of Ukraine, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom as having had citizens on this flight and, um, uh, and all other uh, interested parties provides an opportunity for, um, for all of you to have a say and to press Iran in ways that uh, other human rights advocates and others who wish to press Iran cannot do so. One prime example of, of such a case uh, occurred in 1996 when the um, editor-in-chief of an Iranian uh, literary magazine, uh, the equivalent of Iran's New Yorker magazine, um, named Farah Sarkouhi, uh, tried to uh, leave Iran to um, come to Frankfurt, Germany to attend a um, a pen meeting and subsequently visit his family. Uh, Sarkoui was kidnapped before boarding the plane. However, Iran refused to accept that he had been kidnapped and um, blamed the Germans for having um, stolen him or having kidnapped him at the other side. Anyway, one of the most beautiful aspects of this case was that um, an international uh, uh, cargo insurance body, air cargo insurance body, uh, after about two weeks that he had disappeared, uh, pressed Iran by saying that if Sarkoui didn't turn up, they would have to cancel all of Iran's insurance coverage for their flights. And, um, and that was obviously going to cost Iran a great deal in trade and uh, it would paralyze, it would have paralyzed Iran's uh, international travel and uh, and cargo trade, and therefore within about 48 hours, uh, Sarkoui was found, and and that set a, a wonderful precedent for uh, everyone to see that whenever there was a small window for the international community to press Iran, uh, that things actually did happen. Um, what I look forward to hearing from everyone on this panel is, number one, obviously, how the, how the unique situation of this particular issue uh, can provide uh, everyone else uh, to uh, influence Iran and to uh, give justice to these families. And, and subsequently, uh, is this an opportunity for, um, for the international community to affect change in the way Iran uh, treats human rights activists and in general uh, make Iran behave uh, far more responsibly um, within the international uh, scene and with respect to its uh, human rights uh, community uh, within. So uh, without further ado, I will now turn um, the conversation over to um, Senator McFadren. Thank you very much, Roya. I am an independent senator in Manitoba, and I want to recognize um, Manitoba is on Treaty 1 territory for the Anishbag Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dakota peoples, and also is the homeland, the heart of the Métis Nation. I very much appreciate this invitation from Professor Kotler and the Center, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing from um, Mr. Esmaleon um, about the reality for families that have suffered such tremendous and tragic loss, and also to hear from my parliamentary colleague, Michael Levitt, Chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, and our Special Advisor, for Canada, Ralph Goodale, and also, of course, to hear more from you, Professor Akhavan, about the nature of this case and what I think we are seeing to be violations of international law that are already actively occurring. In particular, as a parliamentarian, I really want to extend to the families who have lost 
um, in many cases, more than one member of their family in PS752 in the bombing of that flight. And to say to you that I'm committed as a parliamentarian, as an independent senator, to do whatever I can to use my voice, to work with my colleagues on the Human Rights Interparliamentary Caucus within Parliament. Hopefully we will be able to be together and working more effectively when um, that is possible in the midst of, of this pandemic. And for our conversation today, I really want to emphasize how important it is that we have the kind of amalgam of voices that have been brought to this virtual roundtable today and to really also state in solidarity with the families and with all of you working in so many different ways on this very important issue, that this is really about transparency and it's about integrity. And it's about upholding international law and standards that are human rights standards. And to not see this in the abstract, to know that what we're really talking about here is the living of human rights, not lip service, and the way in which we, in my case as a parliamentarian, but really all of us working together from many different perspectives, can activate and galvanize the systems that are at play here with this overarching goal of reaching some form of justice and accountability and reparations for the families who have suffered such a tremendous loss. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Miigwech, merci. Mr. Levitt, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and thank you to the Raoul Wallenberg Center and Erwin Kotler for inviting me to address this event to commemorate the victims of UIA flight PS752 and call for justice and accountability from the Iranian regime. It's been just over six months since an Iranian surface to air missile destroyed flight 752, taking the lives of 176 innocent men, women, and children, including so many Canadians. In the immediate aftermath, it was hard to find a member of the Iranian Canadian community who did not know one of the victims. This tragedy deeply touched all Canadians. As we remember the victims of this crime, we must always be relentless in the pursuit of justice for them and their families and for all Canadians. Immediately in January, we saw concerted action by Canada and the other countries impacted by this tragedy to secure both an appropriate investigation and reparations for the families. Canada's convening of the International Coordination and Response Group for the victims of flight PS752, including Afghanistan, Sweden, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom, was an important step forward in working to hold the Iranian regime accountable and helping families seek closure. Unfortunately, given the regime's decision to deflect and deny responsibility, this work is ongoing, but we must not stop. Canada must continue working with our international partners to ensure a comprehensive, transparent investigation and compensation for the victims' families. Just last month, the Iranian foreign minister finally agreed to send the black boxes to France for, an for analysis after months of resistance and reversals. Similarly, the regime finally agreeing to enter into negotiations on reparations is an important and necessary step forward towards helping families find closure. But can they be trusted? Not just in Canada, but every affected country and member of the international community must continue to tirelessly hold Iran to account and seek transparency, justice and compensation on behalf of the families and loved ones of the victims. I'm skeptical that the Iranian regime will follow through on these commitments, and we must continue to be clear-eyed about anything this regime co commits to given our prior experiences. 
The denials, hiding of evidence, intimidations of victims' families, and the lead Iranian investigator's removal for admitting that the regime knew it was putting civilian airliners in danger all speak to the regime's culpability in this situation. Despite the release of the regime's report into the crash, crash this past weekend, it's clear that their focus is on shifting blame rather than accepting responsibility. There must be a full and transparent investigation in accordance with international standards and reparations for victims' families. The basis for all our actions must be accountability. Sorry, the, the, uh, it must be accountability. The Iranian regime and the individual officials who order and profit from its injustices must be held responsible for these actions. Time and time again, we've seen that the Iranian regime is a bad actor domestically and internationally. Every year we see a further decline in the human rights situation in Iran and the increasing export of its contempt for human rights and terror across the Middle East and beyond. This is a regime that has institutionalized discrimination and persecution against women, LGBTQ persons, religious minorities, including the Baha'i and other marginalized groups. It is our duty to continue to shine a light on the mistreatment of women who suffer under the misogynistic legal and political system the Iranian people who suffer from corruption done with impunity, including the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and senior officials and judges who pillage the Iranian economy for personal gain, for the political prisoners who suffer for their beliefs, for the dual nationals, religious leaders, journalists, academics, environmentalists, for all the people this regime has made to suffer, for the terror that Iran has, has exported around the world, threatening millions of people, not just regionally, but well beyond. Every May in Parliament, we hold the annual Iran Accountability Week. This year would have been the eighth year. And while we could not gather to hear firsthand testimony of those affected by the regime, we are united in calling for justice for the regime's victims. While Canada continues to uphold strict sanctions against Iran for its atrocious human rights record and weapons programs, we must continue to push for accountability and an end to this impunity, raising our voices as we do every year as a leader on the resolution on Iranian human rights and repression adopted by the United Nations, but also using every legal and legislative tool at our disposal, including the Justi Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act and Magnitsky sanctions against the individuals responsible for these crimes. It's imperative that we continue to work together to ensure a full and transparent investigation, hold those responsibilities to account, and ensure justice for the victims of Flight 752 for their families and for all Canadians. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prime Minister, uh, uh, <laughs> Parliamentary Representative uh, Mr. Levitt. Um, and I will move on to uh, Mr. Ismail Yoon, um, Payal Mahavan, and uh, Honorable uh, Judge Kotler. Um, to introduce uh, Mr. Hamid Ismail Yoon, who has lost his wife and his daughter in a, on that flight. Um, I need to say first and foremost, something that uh, probably most of you don't have access to, which is that um, Mr. Ismail Yoon has uh, been, in addition to a professional uh, dentist, um, a writer as well, but in the past six months, he has also managed to become singularly the voice of all the people in Iran who have lost a loved one at the hands of this regime. His uh, social media account uh, chronicling the, his own experience of the loss has become the go-to place for all the people who have either a prisoner in prison or have had a loved one uh, die at the hands of the regime. So um, he's more than the spokesperson for the victims' families. He's become one of the spokespeople for the nation as well. Um, Payam Akhavan um, has been a human rights attorney and an outspoken person um, on behalf of um, many victims around the world. Uh, he is a senior fellow at the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, a professor of international law at McGill University and a senior fellow at Massey College, University of Pro Toronto. And uh, he holds many other academic appointments at universities around the world. He was formerly a UN prosecutor at The Hague, uh, served on the UN human rights, uh, served as the human 
um, rights investigator for the UN in the cases of that involved Bosnian, Cambodian, East Timorese, Guatemalan, and Rwandese violations, and currently serves as uh, counsel and advocate before the International Court of Justice, including uh, the cases of Rohingya um, minority um, from Myanmar. He has been uh, one of the close counsels of, uh, to the families of uh, Flight uh, 752 um, in the past several months. And what was not on the bio that he submitted is that he and I, along with um, a third person who happens to be my husband, established the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center in 2001 in Connecticut, uh, which has since um, been gathering and accumulating and producing reports on the violations of human rights in Iran. Last but not least, uh, Honorable Professor Irvin Kotler, the chair of the Raoul Wallenberg uh, foundation um, has a, a very, very particularly exciting uh, bio. He is the Emeritus Professor of Law at McGill University, former Minister of Justice, and Attorney General of Canada, a longtime member of Parliament, international human rights lawyer, and counsel to prisoners of conscience um, from many countries around the world. He's a founder and chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Um, he has also been um, a counsel to the uh, Supreme Court of the United States um, on many, many cases that he has been consulted with. Um, I received a letter from him this morning, an email saying, uh, keep my bio short, so I will keep his bio short, but um, we all need to look him up. Um, last but not least, um, uh, the concluding remarks today will be delivered by um, by Mr. Uh, Honorable La Ralph Goodell, Prime Minister's Special Advisor on Canada's ongoing response to the Ukrainian International Airlines tragedy. Um, he was first elected to the Parliament of Canada in 1974 at the age of 24. And since then, um, Honorable um, Ralph Goodell has served in many capacities um, in the Canadian government and parliament, um, including most recently as the leader of the government in the House of Commons, Minister of Public Works and Government Services, Minister of Finance and Minister of Public Sa Safety and Emergency Preparedness. I now turn the floor over to Mr. Ismailium. We are the survivors of a crime. We are the mothers and fathers wandering around airports, clenching a child's jacket. We are desperately searching for our children and grandchildren. We are the tired, heartbroken spouses still holding a bouquet of flowers while we mourn the loss of our lovers over the skies of an airport. We are the grief-stricken children tormented by the nightmare of explosions in the skies. We are the brothers and sisters with nothing left other than the silent pictures on our walls. We are the survivors of a crime. Since January 8, 2020, we are the survivors of a crime. We only bought airplane tickets. We are imprisoned in an eternal winter and we know that other than the warmth of our hand, our bleeding hearts, we have nothing to warm our shivering bones with. Look at us now. Our airplane was shut down. Look at us now, baffled by inhumanity and cold-blooded murder. Was it with intent? How will we know without investigations? How will we know when the truth is bulldozed away and buried secretly? But no one accepts the truth as everyone around us insists that we must be patient, that we must wait, that the truth is confidential. Our case is in the clutches of intelligence and military organizations, but we know that our loved ones were sacrificed for either the beginning or the end of someone else's war. 
They were sacrificed for the ambitions of religious leaders in Tehran, sacrificed for the warmongering generals of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, intoxicated by delusions of exporting their revolution. We know that our loved ones were used as human shields. Everyone knows, but no one utters the truth. We are the survivors of a crime. The crime scene was destroyed and the belongings of our loved ones were shamelessly pillaged, stolen, looted and buried. The wedding rings of our loved ones were pulled off of their lifeless hands while their murderers stood over their corpses congratulating us for their martyrdom. They lied to us. They lied to the world. They said nothing of the truth and other than a handful of lies, they gave us nothing of the remains of our loved ones to remember them by. We are expected to be happy that Canadian investigators were permitted to visit the destroyed crash site, allowing them the privilege of photographing a few pieces of debris after bulldozers had flattened the smoldering land upon which the truth could have been pieced together. We are the survivors of a crime. Look at us. We had no opportunity to mourn. Look at us. We have been robbed of the chance to weep alone. During every one of the past 187 days, we have shivered in torment hearing news from the Iranian propaganda machine or some other country. News of secret agreements, the fate of the black boxes, and the silence of international organizations. We have been writing letters over and over again, every day delivering them with shaking hands and writing more with jittery fingers. We huddled together, organized an association. We shared our most intimate memories and biographies of 176 passengers, children, PhD students, professors, eight entire families, innocent victims whose aspirations, dreams, and achievements shall never be realized. We shared our private photos and videos against our will so the world will not forget us. Every night when the rest of the world sleeps, we lay down unable to close, close our tearful eyes, wishing never to awaken in this desperate world of injustice and treachery. We are the survivors of a crime, IKO, hides behind neutrality without any recollection of why it was founded 75 years ago. They patronize us with empty slogans of neutrality and lessons to respect in respect for the sovereignty of their members. They insist on treating equally those who break the law and the victims who deserve justice. We say to them, they murdered 176 human beings. They say we must support all sides. We say they will never have real investigation into their own crimes. We say their the aviation agencies are not independent. They say they are controlled by the perpetrators of the crime that took our loved ones from us. We say at least condemn their actions, but they remain silent. We are the survivors of a crime. The backroom negotiations of politicians from different countries have robbed our eyes of any sleep. They speak of reopening embassies over the graves of our loved ones. They negotiate the price of, our, of their lives. What is the price of a nine-year-old passenger who has spoken three languages and made beautiful drawings? What about the 20-year-old girl with beautiful hair who was going to be a physician? How about the price of the university professor who loved sitting in the shade and kiss his little, his little daughter? We ask them to step away, to step away from the auction block. We say that without independent, fair investigations and justice, there is no compensation. We say that compensation for us is knowing the truth and justice itself. We say that our compensation is in knowing how our loved ones were taken away from us and why. For us, the compensation is knowing that no one will ever have to endure the pain we are to endure for the rest of our lives. Instead, we hear that the law is the law. We say that we want the truth. They say, you must wait. But can you see? Can you see that we waited seven months for the damned black boxes? Can you see that the black boxes are the first item in any airplane crash investigations? 
that they are not the last items to reveal the truth. Seven months we waited. Lockerbie, two days. MH17, four days. Ethiopian Airlines, four days. Pakistani Airlines, just this past May, four days before the black box were read. Instead, we must endure a laughable third report insisting that the military installation was misaligned for by 107 degrees. Are there any secret deals? We don't know. Are there any backroom agreements? We don't know. We waited seven months for the black boxes and still do not do not know if they ever delivered them or not, if there's anything on them or not, if they have been destroyed or not. They say that we must prepare ourselves for years to struggle. We say, do not scare us with the passage of time. All of our watches are frozen on 18 minutes past six o'clock in the morning of January 8 in Tehran. Do not scare us with five years or 10 years. We walk, we breathe, but we are not alive to feel the passage of time. We were on that airplane too, but we were not buried. We are still flying on that fiery airplane as passengers of the crashing inferno that shall continue to fly for the remainder of our terrifying lives, terrifying lives. We are the survivors of a crime and we know that the Islamic Republic draws from 22 years of organized crime to misrepresent the truth to buy more time. They seek to buy so much time until we tire and perish in desperation one by one. No, we fear no, we fear not the passage of time or the intrigue of politics, nor do we fear the complexities of international diplomacy. The threats of tyrants nor the intimidations of their operatives. We will not relent in our fight for justice and our demands to treat our lost loved ones with, with dignity. For they were not numbers on a ticket or a statistics, statistics on a chart but innocent human beings that deserve to live their lives. What is the meaning of neutrality when we speak of innocent victims and perpetrators of a crime? Our demands are clear. One, we shall never ex accept the results of investigations that are led by Iranian government. If the IKO laws do not account for a case of this kind, change the laws, not the truth. Do not leave the perpetrators to investigate their own crime. We shall not accept their conclusions. Change the rules so no other government ever dares to, to fire missiles at innocent passengers three minutes after their own airport at 4,000 feet. Two, three reports published by Iranian government prove that the airspace over Iran is not safe. Until the PS752 crime is not resolved, close the Iranian civilian air corridor. Do not reward criminals, prosecute them instead, and by doing so, save the lives of more passengers and crew. Save lives instead of supporting criminals. Ask who gave the orders to keep the airspace over Tehran open during military conflict. Ask who ordered the firing of the missiles and why. Ask who gave permission to fly despite warnings from safety and transportation organizations, ask why the crash site was destroyed within hours or why evidence was destroyed, ask why witnesses were intimidated and family members were persecuted, threatened and intimidated. Think of the lives that will be lost if you don't find the answers of these questions. Three, we ask the Canadian government to open criminal investigations into this crime. The Iranian government will not cooperate and they are disqualified to lead the investigation. It is imperative that a criminal investigation is initiated by Canada. It is necessary that truth and justice shall come before compensation. Canada lost 85 of its citizens and residents. Help us to open this case in an impartial, impartial international tribunal where truth matters. Four. We want to have an observer representative in the investigations. We are the biggest stakeholders in this tra tragedy and deserve to know everything. We have no trust whatsoever in the Iranian officials. We have lost our faith in the ICAO. 
Other parties to this case also seem to have capitulated to accepting the Iranian government to lead the investigations. Under these circumstances, no secret or classified information has any meaning for us, the survivors of a crime. The world must expose any and all information and share those un unconditionally with us, the families of the victims. How can we trust the world that is that in over six months has failed to compel a murderous, oppressive government to surrender even the black boxes? If our demands are not met, if the laws don't change, our fate will be the same as that of the families of Zahra Kazemi, Kavu Seyed Amami, Saeed Malikpur, Nilufar Bayani, and many, many others. In fact, the world's fate will be, will be no different should the Iranian government be allowed to make a mockery of international law and human rights with impunity. We are the survivors of this crime, so do something so there will be no more. Thank you, Mr. Ismailoun, for those very powerful and deeply touching words. Um, I now turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Payam Akhavan. Um, thank you, Roya, and um, I am uh, begin by expressing my uh, deepest condolences to my dear friend and brother, Hamed, uh, for the loss of his daughter and, and his wife, uh, and extend the same condolences to all the families who've lost their loved ones in something which one could simply call a tragedy. But I think the Raoul Wallenberg Center, uh, for whom I have the, the greatest respect to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Kotler, has said it right in the title of this event, Seek Securing Justice and Accountability for the Canadians Murdered in the Bombing of Flight. PS752. So I would like to explore the idea of murder, the idea of a killing, which is not just the result of human error, but the result at the very least of criminal recklessness, of deliberately putting civilian aircraft in harm's way in circumstances where it was foreseeable that PS752 would be shot down. I begin by saying that the road to justice, uh, we know very well, those of us who are involved in international law and human rights struggles, the road to justice is long and tortuous. And I want to recognize the tremendous outpouring of grief and support by the Canadian public, which touched me deeply as a Canadian uh, Iranian. And I think that uh, we should be very grateful that the Prime Minister has appointed a, a person of the reputation and caliber of uh, Ralph uh, Goodale uh, to uh, uh, address this uh, pressing matter for uh, Canada, uh, and not just the families of the victims, but for all of us who call ourselves Canadians, this is a, a matter of great importance to make sure that there is justice for this crime. But I also want to emphasize that this is not some, something that is going to be addressed in the short run. There has to be a long-term uh, commitment or else we will never see justice. Bearing that in mind, I just want to provide a brief overview of the undisputed facts so that we are clear about the framing of the destruction of PS752. We know that on January 3rd, the United States uh, uh, killed uh, General Qasem Soleimani in Baghdad airport. We know that Iran threatened retaliation against the United States. And by January 7, Iran had mobilized its ballistic missiles to attack two US air bases, uh, in two US military bases in Iraq, uh, in Anbar province and Erbil respectively. At 10.30 PM on January 7th, a Tor M1 surface to air missile system was positioned close to a military base in Tehran. At 1.30 a.m. on January 8th, uh, 12 uh, ballistic missiles were launched towards uh, the U.S. military base in Anbar province, and five 
against another military base in Erbil. The reason why uh, the IRGC had the Tor M1 missile systems stationed throughout Tehran is because they anticipated an American counterattack. And under those circumstances, it is blindingly obvious, blindingly obvious that the airspace should have been closed. In fact, the International Civil Aviation Organization has a specific regulation in respect of the safety of civil airliners uh, in the context of military activities. And we also know that the airspace should have been closed because on January 11, after three days of denial, when uh, the evidence became overwhelming that the aircraft had in fact been shot down and the Iranian government and the IRGC had to admit what had happened, General Hajizadeh, the uh, commander of the IRGC aerospace uh, forces himself said, and I quote, we requested several times that the airspace should be clear. And this was under circumstances where the military forces were on the highest military alert. And then he goes on to say, but because of the consideration of certain dear ones, this did not happen, meaning to say the airspace was not closed. Who are the dear ones that General Hajizadeh refers to? Well, if one looks at the IRGC chain of command, the next person up is the IRGC commander in chief, General Hussein Salam. And of course, General Hussein Salam is part of the Supreme National Security Council, um, which apparently collectively made the decision to use civilian airliners as human shields because it offered a certain military advantage, whether in not alerting the United States to Iran's impending ballistic missile attack or in deterring an American counterattack by using civilian airliners. Under these circumstances, it is not entirely far-fetched to speak about murder. Recklessness is a state of mind where one whether uh, uh, certain consequences intended or not, knowingly takes a risk, knowing that the consequences, in this particular case, the destruction of a civilian airliner is a foreseeable consequence. Hamid referred to the recent report that was produced by Iran. Uh, the report, um, uh, I believe, raises far more questions than it answers. I have never heard of a situation in which the Tor M1 missile system, one of the most sophisticated system, each unit of which cost $25 million, Russian manufactured, cannot tell the difference between North and South. A compass purchased from Canadian Tire would be able to tell someone which direction is North and which direction is South. Um, and to add to that, the idea that it's impossible to tell the difference using this sophisticated radar system between a massive civilian airliner with two giant engines flying in a northwesterly direction and a cruise missile coming purportedly from a southeasterly direction, uh, in addition to a numerous other uh, leaps in logic, suggests that the investigation is nothing but whitewash. I want to uh, conclude, given the limited time that we have, by saying that we have to listen to the voices of Hamid and those who've lost their loved ones. Compensation is important, but secondary to justice. And justice uh, in the international context requires the full exploration of all the options which are available. And that includes, among other things, the 1971 Montreal Convention on the Safety of Civil Aviation, which obligates states to investigate and prosecute those that are responsible for the destruction of civilian aircraft. And I will end by noting the irony that after Iran Air Flight 655 was shot down by the USS Vincennes in the Persian Gulf in 1988, that is exactly what Iran demanded of the United States. So I would hope that Canada, in concert 
with the Ukraine and the other concerned governments and with his support of the international community will make it clear to Iran that it cannot uh, simply buy its way uh, out of justice uh, by offering some measure of compensation. And I'm skeptical whether they will even offer uh, uh, compensation and that the international community demands that those responsible for, in effect, the murder uh, of the 176 passengers uh, should be brought to justice. So I, I once again thank the uh, Wallenberg Center uh, and my uh, dear friends and colleagues, uh, Senator McFedrin, uh, Mr. Levitt, uh, Mr. Goodale, and, and Irwin Kotler for joining the Canadian Iranian community in seeking justice and accountability for this crime. Thank you, Payam. Uh, this was a very succinct summary. Um, it also laid out very well um, for the possibilities that can be pursued um, beyond the mere issue of compensation, which I think is really key in this case, given Iran's track record on, on all the other violations of human rights and the necessity for Iran to, um, to really be held accountable, um, especially in the absence of um, other international involvement between Iran and the European uh, or the American Western uh, communities in general. Um, I will now turn the floor over to Professor Kotler, um, who uh, chairs the Raoul Wallenberg Foundation. And uh, together, both he and the foundation have become two of the most important, if not the most important voices uh, advocating for the cause of human rights in Iran today. that we meet at an important moment of remembrance in the immediate aftermath of the six month anniversary of the tragic and criminal downing of the Ukrainian airliner, where 176 passengers were killed, amongst whom were 55 Canadians and 30 permanent residents. Iran initially, sought to cover this up, but was forced to admit that its revolutionary guards shot down the plane. But as the Canadian government put it at that moment, and I quote, this tragedy should never have occurred and the families and loved ones deserve to know why and how it happened. Indeed, the remembrance and horror of this tragedy are indelibly imprinted in the minds and hearts of the survivors, their families and loved ones, as Hamid and Payam so compellingly and eloquently articulated. A number of initiatives have been launched, very briefly. Canada announced the formation of an international coordination and response group, along with uh, four other countries who lost their citizens. On March 31st, Ralph Goodale was appointed a special advisor, and I'm delighted he is part of this conversation today. The families of the victims established an international association for redress and justice, and you heard Hamid's most compelling remarks in that regard. Professor Payam Akaban, as its lead counsel, has laid out the legal framework, and both our parliamentarians in both houses have articulated the involvement of these houses. In particular, however, what is happening with respect to this inquiry can only be understood against the background of Khamenei's Iran. And I use that term to distinguish it from the people and the publics of Iran who continue to be the targets of mass domestic repression. What we have been witnessing in Khamenei's Iran is backdrop and context for the massive domestic repression, the culture of corruption criminality and impunity that underpins it, that has found expression in the ongoing criminalization of fundamental freedoms, the criminalization of women's rights, the criminalization of environmental rights, 
where environmental protection has been made a crime. The criminalization of religious and ethnic rights, where it's referenced the Baha'i, our metaphor and message, and the arrest, imprisonment, torture, and detention of leaders of all civil society groups in Iran, be they journalists, students, trade union leaders, lawyers, human rights defenders. In a word, we have been witnessing in Iran, and it continues as we meet the criminalization of innocence. It is against this backdrop and context that the following violations must be appreciated and understood. One, the Iranian, first, the Iranian regime appointed Chief Justice Ibrahim Raisi to lead the investigation. Chief Justice Raisi was a member of the death squads of 1988 that executed thousands of Iranian dissidents. The House of Commons, a Canadian parliament, unanimously adopted a resolution declaring these executions to be, in a word, crimes against humanity and established a political prisoner day to commemorate the victims. Second, Iran appointed a close associate of Ibrahim Raisi, a close associate of Raisi, to be the speaker of the Iranian parliament. Third, the black boxes that have been mentioned have yet to be examined, a case study of Iranian national, sorry, a case study of Iranian national delay obfuscation and denial. Number four, the families of the victims, and we should never forget this, as we meet, continue to be harassed, intimidated, and threatened, a cruel mockery of any form of consolation, support, or compensation for the families. Number five, peaceful protesters in Iran protesting the tragedy and its cover-up have themselves been imprisoned. Number six, students engaged in a memorial ceremony for the victims in Shiraz had themselves been sentenced to long-term imprisonment. Finally, and perhaps most important, Iran's chief, <coughs> Iran's chief investigator of the tragedy, as Payam pointed out, disclosed that in fact, Iran violated civilian airspace in order to cover up an imminent attack. As Payam put it, putting the civilians as human shields to cover up a crime. In conclusion, the challenge for a transparent, independent, just and accountable inquiry with compensation and closure for the victims remains. This will require, number one, that there be an independent, impartial, and accountable investigation. And this was, must be a first demand by the International Coordination and Response Group. Two, it should ask for the Chief Justice Raisi to be replaced as head of the inquiry. Number three, it should call on Iran to cease and desist from all forms of repression, of media, of protesters, of mourners. Number four, it should ask Iran to cease and desist from any ongoing intimidation and harassment of families and loved ones. It should call on Iran to finally establish an independent, transparent, and impartial inquiry, and since it arguably unable to do so, then what we need at this point is the international community to establish an international and independent inquiry. Finally, we need to explore the various legal remedies that could be available, including interstate remedies, such as an initiative before the International Court of Justice, criminal prosecution, civil remedies, class actions, and the like. In a word, the original demand 
need requirement for an independent, impartial, international inquiry providing justice and accountability, justice for the victims, accountability for the violators, compensation and closure still remains and demands to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Kotler. What you just summarized in those few sentences is really key as we hear, especially here um, in the United States and I'm, um, within the Persian speaking media that had the United States not conducted its assassination against the Iranian general in Iraq, um, it would not have prompted or the, uh, the bombing or the shooting down of the flight would have never happened. Um, of course, it seems very obvious to the rest of us um, why this makes no sense. However, um, for those who are trying to create uh, uh, the grounds to justify Iran's attack, um, the remarks that you just made um, are very key in remembering how Iran, Iran has been operating over the span of 40 years, that, um, that it cannot one action or one possibly error uh, by the United States or any other international body cannot explain um, the shooting down of the flight because we know uh, that in that over the span of the last 40 years, how Iran has uh, violated or um, has conducted uh, numerous acts that it has blamed the international community, the sanctions or other pressures on it, um, it used these to uh, justify its own wrongdoings. So thank you for those um, essential remarks. I will turn the floor over to um, Honorable Mr. Goodell. There, did that work? Good, thank you. Roya, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and uh, distinguished guests uh, uh, on this uh, important panel. Um, um, good morning from Saskatchewan. Good afternoon to where uh, most of you are, uh, are located. Um, uh, I too acknowledge, as uh, Senator McFedrin did earlier, uh, that I'm speaking today from the territory of Treaty Number no. Four. Um, uh, let me uh, uh, begin by uh, once again expressing the profound condolences, not only of myself, but uh, obviously the government of Canada, uh, to the families of, of the victims who have uh, uh, suffered so, so very much. And you heard that expressed in a very tangible and moving way by, by Hamed a few moments ago. Um, all Canadians uh, shared that sense of loss and grievance and, and outrage. And even though it is now uh, uh, a week beyond uh, six months, uh, when this uh, horrible, horrible event occurred. Um, the, uh, the feelings among the families are as raw and emotional as they were at the beginning, understandably so. Uh, but I believe the, the steadfast commitment of Canadians uh, remains uh, as strong as it was uh, at the outset. Uh, and even though uh, there has been uh, a considerable passage of time and there will be more. Um, we cannot allow our resolve in any way to weaken with, uh, uh, with the, uh, the days that go by. Uh, I, I want to thank all the participants, uh, Senator McFedrin, good to see you again, and Michael. Um, it's, it's always uh, it's always a pleasure to be associated with uh, colleagues and former for, former colleagues, uh, and uh, to the members of the of the panel, Mr. Ismailian, uh, uh, Professor Akavan, and uh, and uh, my friend and colleague Erwin Kotler. Uh, it's uh, it's it's good to uh, to hear all of you uh, as you um, uh, talk in such a 
a learned way about this uh, this horrible situation. Uh, my purpose in joining the uh, the discussion today is uh, to listen. Uh, my function is to offer uh, advice and uh, and counsel to the Prime Minister and the Government of Canada. Um, my mandate is really threefold, and in what you have said uh, in this conversation for the last hour, uh, you have touched on all parts of the mandate. Uh, number one, assist Ministers Champagne and Garneau uh, in their pursuit of uh, accountability and transparency and ultimately justice for the families. Partly that is dealing with the immediate needs, uh, such as the, uh, the consular issues that had to be dealt with, the travel arrangements that had to be organized, uh, the initial uh, compensation funding that was not compensation, but, but funding for the families to assist with their costs, uh, and a, a variety of other uh, administrative uh, arrangements, repatriation of... Uh, of the, the remains of, uh, of the victims, um, helping in, in uh, many, many different ways to try to uh, uh, alleviate the, uh, the angst and the anguish of uh, this, this awful time. Um, so part of the mandate is to support the ministers in the ongoing effort that, uh, uh, that we'll need to, to continue. Uh, the second part of my mandate uh, is to develop for Canada um, uh, an inventory of the very best governmental practices to be uh, available if and when another tragedy of this nature uh, should present itself. We all hope it never will, but um, we all realize that uh, uh, we may have to face this sometime in the future. Well, we need to have the accumulated experience from, from this horrible event uh, together with others in our past and recent past uh, to make sure that we have, uh, we have, if you will, an instruction man manual for the government of Canada for how to deal with all of the issues that come from these awful circumstances, but most particularly uh, how do you best address the pressing needs of the families of the victims? Um, the third uh, re requirement of my mandate uh, is to offer advice in support of Canada's uh, Safer Skies initiative to identify ways in which the international community can prevent this from ever happening again. And that was the last portion of uh, Ahmed's very passionate presentation. Uh, how do we make sure that uh, to the extent we can, that uh, the rules are changed, the procedures are changed uh, in international law and international behavior uh, to uh, prevent the circumstances that led to this uh, awful disaster uh, from, from happening again. Um, just excuse me a moment. I, I listened um, once again today to, uh, to uh, the passion with which uh, Mr. Ismailian uh, addressed us all. Uh, it was heart-wrenching, the grief, and the anger are very real and entirely, entirely normal, natural. Uh, that's how a human being reacts. And as, as painful as this is, that passion from him and from the other members of the families that I've had the opportunity to uh, meet at least in a virtual way because of uh, the limitations that have been posed upon us in terms of travel and communication. We've had the opportunity to, uh, to communicate um, over the phone and, and um, through video conferences like this. 
Uh, but constantly hearing the repetition of his and the other family's grief, that's the fuel that will continue to drive the pursuit of justice and real answers and the truth. And uh, Ahmed, I, I welcome your unrelenting determination to make sure that this process gets to where it, uh, it needs to be. Uh, and let me say in a, in a practical way, uh, I really do value the contribution that Ahmed and other family members have, have made, the ongoing contribution to the collection of essential information and, uh, and evidence. Um, there have been, there's been a great volume of material submitted by the families uh, who are monitoring every bit of activity that is going on and doing so in several different languages and making that information, uh, the interviews, the commentaries, the social media uh, material and, and so forth, making all of that available to the, uh, the appropriate investigative uh, agencies in the government of Canada. And all of that is being meticulously assembled uh, for the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, forensic analysis that, uh, that, that needs to be done. Um, uh, and that, that, that work is, uh, is underway. It is, it is painstaking. Uh, it is voluminous. Uh, in some ways it's expensive, but we have made the, the, uh, the very clear commitment that uh, uh, we will do everything in our power. We will leave no stone unturned where we've got the ability to turn it. Uh, in order to, uh, uh, to get to the, the truth. And we certainly hear the point that uh, Ahmed and um, uh, Professor Akhavan uh, and, and, and others have made that, um, that the compensation and the other reparations that are contemplated in international law are important and we will go through the process uh, that we're required to follow in order to deal with those issues. But money is not the issue here. Um, the issue is the truth. Uh, and there are two sets of questions for which we, we need very clear answers. There are hundreds of questions, but two sets of questions that are particularly important. One set is what exactly is the sequence of events and what exactly was the sequence of decision-making that led to two missiles being fired at a civilian aircraft, killing 176 people, including 55 Canadians and 30 permanent residents. Uh, meticulously, we need to reassemble that flow of events to understand exactly what happened and why and how it happened. And then secondly, the fundamental question, why was that aircraft in the air at that particular point in time? And why was that airspace over a conflict zone open? And how was that decision taken that led to uh, PS752 um, mm -hmm. flying into mortal jeopardy? I very much appreciate the, um, the advice and the counsel of uh, uh, an old friend like Erwin Kotler and a new friend like uh, Paya Makaban, uh, both of whom I've had the opportunity to consult as we've done our work so far. And I look forward to uh, continuing that, that consultation. Um, Professor Akaban made the point uh, about a long-term commitment uh, this is going to take great patience and unquenchable, unquenchable perseverance. Um, we have both. Uh, we will work for the answers as quickly as we can get them. Uh, but it is going to take uh, a lot of patience and perseverance in order to get to the truth. Um, and we will, uh, we will do what we need to do to 
solve as much as we can uh, that that thirst for facts and information and knowledge and wisdom and the truth. Um, we uh, don't underestimate the magnitude of the challenge um, or the, uh, the uh, impediments that will be uh, put in our way, uh, but we will work assiduously on our own. We will work in close partnership with Ukraine that has a very important role to play here as the domicile of the aircraft. And in the international frame of things, that's important. Um, and the other countries, Sweden, the UK, uh, Afghanistan, uh, in order to uh, bring all the leverage of um, international influence uh, to bear in helping us to get the answers that the that the families deserve. Um, it's a it's a painful, gut wrenching experience. I think this is the this is the toughest assignment I've ever had as uh, um, someone engaged on behalf of uh, the government of Canada. Uh, but I will uh, do my very best, and I know that that applies to uh, Minister Champagne, Minister Garneau, uh, and certainly to the Prime Minister, uh, to uh, bring uh, a satisfactory conclusion to a bitterly painful experience. And for all of your counsel and advice and suggestions and recommendations, uh, I thank you for that this morning. Uh, and uh, you may rest assured that, that all of the uh, uh, input that you have to offer uh, will be uh, valued uh, highly by the government of Canada as we work to get to the answers that are required. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the moving words, um, Honorable Mr. Goodell. Um, we have come to the end of our panel, and um, I want to say that just as Hamid has become the voice of so many people who have lost a loved one in the past 40 years in Iran and or have uh, their children or their loved ones in prison, um, this case too has become a focal point for Iranians everywhere. Um, and uh, all eyes are on this task, on the job of this committee to uh, achieve a justice that um, not only the victims of this case are long overdue, but the nation has been long trying to achieve over the past 40 years. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, it, uh, its reverberations and its consequences will surely go um, beyond just this uh, particular flight. And we all wish you great luck. And uh, thank you, especially to Canada for taking um, the lead on advocating for the issue of human rights in Iran. And um, more than any other nation um, in the past many years. And um, thank you especially to the Raoul Wallenberg Center for having become a voice um, for those people who have otherwise, um, you know, as immigrants, as refugees, uh, have no other place to turn to. Uh, so thank you all. And, um, and we all, I'm sure, um, we'll never forget the words that we particularly heard from uh, Hamid and may he and others lead uh, our way through a day that will um, see justice be done to this case.